the live button, so we should be live now. Awesome. You guys want me to get started? Um, we'll introduce you. Introduction? Okay. Hello, Web Shadowers. Thank you all for attending our session this afternoon. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Chan, who is a radiologist and is specialized in breast imaging. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video. Dr. Chan, you may start whenever you're ready. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tiffany. I am a practicing breast radiologist in Los Angeles. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be a radiologist and give you some cases uh, that I see on a kind of daily basis. Um, so I have a few goals for you today. Uh, the first thing is I'm going to share a little bit about myself and the journey that I took to get into radiology. Um, I'm going to give you a day in the life of uh, what I do uh, as a breast radiologist. And lastly, I will also show uh, some different types of imaging, um, see some cases, learn some pathologies and share with you some procedures that we also do as well. Uh, and of course, no uh, breast radiology lecture would be complete without some um, you know, dabbling on current screening mammography guidelines. So I'll go over that as well. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm currently an attending uh, physician on faculty at an academic hospital, uh, UCLA, and I'm considered junior faculty because I'm in my second year as an attending. I actually did my fellowship here um, just about two years ago at the same place at UCLA. So in the pink here, you can see that this is kind of my journey. Um, I went straight through from college until now, meaning that I took no time off. And actually, this is kind of an unusual sort of path. I thought that everybody did this. Um, but, you know, in my experience and when I actually went to med school, I learned that a lot of people actually took time off between, let's say, even college and medical school. Um, and some of that has to do with, you know, getting into med school. Um, so if you aren't able to the first time, by no means, don't be discouraged. Um, there have been people who get in the second time or even the third time. Um, and then there's other people who just did a different career. Um, one of my good friends, uh, I believe was in investment banking and she worked in hedge funds. Uh, and then she kind of had a change of heart and she came to medical school. Um, so there's definitely different pathways to get here. Um, I kind of had an idealistic way of what I had planned in my life. And I was just very lucky that I got accepted uh, throughout the process. Um, one thing to note as well, um, for diagnostic radiology, we do have to do what we call an intern year. Uh, this is just a single year um, after medical school before dedicated residency. You can do it in either medicine, surgery, or something called transitional year, which is a combination of both. But the idea is basically to just get some uh, general uh, clinical training before radiology. So I chose to do surgery because I love uh, procedures and I wanted to become more and more efficient at managing patient care. That really helped me as well too throughout my residency. My residency was four years in diagnostic radiology, and then I did a fellowship at UCLA in breast imaging. Um, and this is a picture of me holding my diploma um, from the American Board of Radiology. And I took this picture because I was just like so proud of myself. It was such a long journey, everyone. Um, but this is kind of like the end product, all summarized in a little piece of paper. So what exactly is radiology? So this is an awesome field that pretty much every other specialty depends on, except for maybe pathology. We work very closely with pathology to help all the other specialties. Essentially, um, you know, everyone from primary care to neurosurgeons are asking us and consulting us to help them make decisions for their patients. We aren't covered on a lot of medical shows. And when we are, it's usually a non-radiologist holding like a picture that's upside down. Um, and while, you know, most physicians, like an orthopedic orthopedic surgeon um, are very good at reading imaging for their specific field, like a knee MRI, for instance. The radiologist's job is always uh, to find things that are more subtle or more abnormal, things that you don't see very often. It's always our job to pick those things out. I think of radiology like reframing everything you've learned in medical school in the form of pictures. So we need to know how things that are normal, like how they look like, and how um, abnormal things look. And actually the toughest thing, one of the tougher things is knowing what a normal variant looks like. So something that doesn't need any intervention, but is, you know, makes up a smaller percentage of the population and is actually normal. 
Radiology represents the truth to me. So pictures don't lie. Okay. Patients can, histories can be faulty, but pictures will always uh, tell us the answer. And the cool thing about radiology too, is that we're always staying on top of the latest technology. Um, so back in the day, only ultrasound and x-ray uh, were the main technologies. Um, and now we have cool things like we have PET CTs, we have MRIs. These are a bunch of pictures from different parts of the body, different sections of radiology that I was trained in during residency. To give you a better idea of all the different specialties within radiology, I created this table here. Interventional or IR is kind of its own thing now, but it's it was its own. It's been part of its our own pathway for a little bit of time, and now its own pathway. Um, these are technically all different fellowships you can do from a diagnostic radiology residency. I did breast. And I also put here too um, examples of some common studies you may have heard of. So for instance, in breast, you know, you may have heard of mammography. In neuro, you may have heard of an MRI spine. So, you know, basically if I was to take a general call, meaning general radiology, I'd be responsible for maybe some of the other different types that I was trained in in residency. I have colleagues, I have friends that I did residency with who, you know, specialized in musculoskeletal and now they are experts in this particular field. Um, in general, most radiologists who work in big cities have had some sort of additional fellowship training like myself, um, but you don't necessarily have to. You can be a general radiologist um, and not do any of these fellowships. It just kind of depends on the location uh, that you want to be in. And there's some myths about radiology that I want to address. And, um, you know, some may think that radiologists are not like real doctors because we're not running down a hallway yelling clear. But ironically, we're the only group that's considered the doctor's doctor. So that means that physicians consult us for what we see and think about a patient's imaging. Uh, for some of our, our certain fellowships or certain specialties, we are also the patient's physician. So in breast imaging and in interventional radiology, we actually see our own patients as well too. Um, some other interesting myths I've heard in the past, like we don't like to socialize. It's kind of funny because we actually work very good hours, which leaves time for socializing, as you can imagine. Um, radiology is definitely not easy, even though a lot of the times uh, when you see a radiologist on call, they're sitting at a computer and it looks like they're just hanging out. In fact, it's actually one of the more difficult fields because like I said, you have to learn medicine from head to toe. And if you remember all those different specialties, we're looking at every single body system um, and every radiologist is trained like that. So it's actually very difficult uh, to succeed in. I put in this slide just as a general idea um, of how you can be a successful applicant into radiology. So this is obviously after uh, college, after medical school, and you're applying to going to radiology residency. So this may be, um, you know, far on the horizon for some of you, but just so you have an idea, um, it is one of the more competitive fields. They, this is actually from uh, the AUR, which is one of the big organizations of radiology that we use. So this is a very reputable source. And they put together this kind of manual on things that they think are are important. Um, and they give a survey for program directors and what they're looking for. Now, for some of you, um, I know that step one is getting phased out into a pass fail sort of situation. Um, but just so you know, in terms of when there were scores, um, you know, what the average of successfully matched uh, senior candidates were. Um, 20, almost 20% were AOA members. This is like the top, top of people. Um, and of course, research, abstract, presentations, all that kind of stuff is important, okay? Um, so scores obviously are probably the, the first thing and also your uh, evaluations on your clerkships are very important. At the end of the day, a lot of people meet these requirements for better or for worse. So what really matters is your interactions with faculty, your interpersonal skills, how you work with other faculty members and how you deal with patients. That all is very, very important. Another interesting slide I wanted to show you too, um, perhaps you've heard of the road to success. And this is traditionally the four specialties that offer the best compensation and lifestyle or overall uh, work-life balance. So I just wanted to show you this because radiologists are generally pretty happy and are compensated well. And by no means should this be a driving force behind your decision about whether you wanna go into medicine in general or into radiology. But, and it's really, and it's really not you know, discussed among pre-meds or medical students, but I bring this up only because it does have practical significance. Um, I had over $300,000 in loans accumulating from college through fellowship. And of course, I mean, the higher your salary is, the quicker you can get through those loans. And that's just something that 
you know, my friends and I discussed my friends who are exactly my year who went into different specialties and we all have similar loans. So just something to think about. Um, the most important graph, I think, is this one here that I would choose the same specialty. As you can see, radiology is fairly high in the list of everyone. So that's always pretty cool. So let me talk to you um, about a typical day in my life. So breast radiology is a specialized field that's dedicated to the diagnosis and management of breast pathologies. So we use something called mammography, and this is an example of a mammogram in case you've never seen one before. It's actually a type of x-ray. That's the best way to think of it. We also use ultrasound and we also use MRI. Here's an example right here for evaluation. And uh, we don't just sit in a dark room either. We actually perform um, procedures. We perform interventional procedures, always under imaging guidance. So everything a radiologist does is going to involve imaging guidance. That means there's going to be some screen somewhere that shows you exactly where you're going inside a patient. So nothing's just blind stabbing, okay? There's always a um, some sort of imaging, whether it's MRI or an angio or an ultrasound, anything like that. Um, we'll be able to actually see where we're going. So we're not damaging any important vessels and we're being uh, quick and efficient about what we need to do. So this is a picture of me performing an ultrasound guided biopsy. The patient's laying on her back. This is the image guided part because this is an ultrasound. Um, this right here, and if you can tell, there's like a little probe that I'm holding here. That's letting me scan back and forth across the breast and that's creating the pictures here. All right. And under that guidance, I can see exactly where my needle is, which is what I'm holding in my other hand. So it's kind of like a like a two hand procedure. So it's one of the common procedures that we do. Um, and I think that, you know, from a practical standpoint, I get asked sometimes if I worry about AI taking over my job, it's going to be a very long time, especially uh, for procedural things for AI to take over. Um, plus, I've always really liked procedures, which is why, like I said before, I did a surgery um, internship. So there you go. And I'll go into more procedures as well later. So specifically, you know, what we do, we do spend some time in a dark issue, room, maybe like 30%. And these rooms that are dark, by the way, it's because so our eyes can see the contrast between very subtle differences. If we were to go in a very bright room, subtle differences are just not going to be able to be seen as well. Um, the majority of my day really is actually seeing patients and discussing my findings with them. So that's different than other radiology fields because we have patients that come to our imaging centers. We call them generally women's imaging centers. Um, they come to our clinic and we actually have a dedicated area where we see our own patients. About 30% of my day, the remaining, um, we spend uh, doing procedures. So we do biopsies, we do abscess drainages. That's for infected pockets of fluid where we want to get that fluid out. We also do cyst aspirations and something called a pre-surgery needle localization, which I'll talk about a little bit later. My typical schedule, this is an average day for me, um, generally starts around eight o'clock. Um, I obviously do some prep work before, and it's a scattering or smattering, I guess, uh, between procedures and diagnostic studies. So as you can see in bold are like the procedures that I do, diagnostic studies are in between, and I'll, in my next slide, talk about what a diagnostic study is. Um, and then in throughout the day, I'm also reading screening mammograms. Uh, about 30 to 40 or so. And I also read breast MRIs, one or two. This is pretty much like every single day. Um, being in academics as well uh, versus private practice, I teach residents, I teach fellows, just like I was taught when I was a fellow um, at this exact same institution. Um, I give one to two lectures every three to four months. I also help work with the resident curriculum to help improve education. I think of innovative ways to teach. This is a picture of me testing out this new um, synthetic uh, biopsy model um, in which I can basically biopsy a fake cancer inside uh, this like jelly sort of thing. Um, and this is very useful when I'm trying to teach residents for the first time how to do a biopsy. Because as you can imagine, um, if you're learning a skill for the first time and it's on a, like a real person, it can be very stressful for you, for your supervising attending, for the patient, for everyone involved. Um, so having like kind of like a training simulation is very useful to get down your hand-eye coordination before you actually work on the real patient. The last part about my academic job too, um, I'm always presenting at conferences, submitting things for presentation, um, and writing up articles uh, to be published in journals. So that's all part of the academic arena. Um, I said earlier that our imaging centers are considered to be women's imaging centers. Um, it's true most of the time, but we actually also see men. So we see men probably one or two a day at each site. 
because men technically can have lumps uh, and pain as well. And most importantly, they can still get breast cancer. It's not super common. It's about 1% of all breast cancers. Ironically, I'm rewatching Nip Tuck, which is a very old show. And one of the main characters that's a, a male uh, ends up getting breast cancer. Spoiler alert. Um, but it does happen both in real life and in Hollywood. So um, it is a concern of ours and something that we always want to make sure we can find. More commonly, um, you know, what we are finding in men are benign uh, pathologies, something called gynecomastia, which is basically proliferation of benign breast tissue, does not become cancer, but can be tender and can be painful. Um, and something called a lipoma, which is a benign fat tumor. Again, not a cancer, but you can't tell uh, before coming to us. Like it always feels the same. So you need some sort of imaging and evaluation for you to know. Um, you can also get other things like lymphoma uh, and other sorts of cancers as well. So let me talk a little bit about diagnostic studies, what I had referred to before. This is kind of what we do in our clinic. There's three categories of things, and I'll talk about diagnostic and screening uh, first. So diagnostic patients are ones that, you know, basically have a specific issue. They might have a symptom. They might have breast pain or breast lump, or they might be here for follow-up. OK, this is a follow up of a what we call probably benign finding someone before me had decided this at a prior appointment. Um, they didn't want to biopsy it, but they wanted a close follow up. So they say, hey, come back in, let's say six months and we'll just double check and make sure everything's OK. The last category of diagnostic are patients that are callbacks from screening, um, callbacks from screening. I'll talk about in a little bit, but these patients are essentially asymptomatic, no symptoms at all. We just found something abnormal on their screening mammogram. So these patients will come to us under the diagnostic category. And then we basically do one of these studies, if not both, a mammogram and or ultrasound. Depends on the age, depends on the finding. And I'll talk about that as well too. We're basically working up an issue to make sure that there's nothing that we need to biopsy. The management, as I say here, uh, is gonna be returned to screening, meaning, hey, everything looks good. We'll see you in a year, which is what mammograms are. They're uh, yearly screening mammograms for people with no symptoms. They may be put back in the follow-up category, which is right here, or they might get a biopsy. We will recommend a biopsy, um, you know, at the next available uh, biopsy slot. Sometimes we may say, hey, get an MRI as well too. But essentially we're making a decision as to whether we need to do anything additional for this patient. And then of course, this is the, the percentage of time I'm saying that we are discussing um, the results with the patient. And these can be very difficult conversations too, because as you can imagine, you're talking to fairly oftentimes nervous patients and you're telling them, Hey, like you need to get a biopsy and this could be cancer. So it's very shocking news for a lot of people. Um, and we are, we have training throughout our residency, throughout our fellowship, um, to help us kind of have that conversation. But of course, every day is basically a new training sort of situation and you're learning new and better ways to deal with many different types of people and their reactions. So the other group, um, we see in our clinic are going to be screening patients. Now, these are patients that have no symptoms, okay, but they just meet certain criteria in the US for getting screening mammograms. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, essentially, the ones that have a normal mammogram, we say, hey, don't worry about anything. You know, it, you don't have any cancer on mammogram, come back to us in a year. Of course, if you feel something, then you come to us sooner. Others will see you in a year. If they have something abnormal, then that's what filters into the callback from screening sort of slide. And then we do the whole workup, okay? So you might be wondering at this point um, what some breast pathologies even are. You probably have heard of breast cancer. You've probably heard of a breast cyst, but beyond that, not much else. So this is just a very brief overview of all the things that we deal with. Of course, we cannot go through each and every one of these things, but this is just to kind of show you the different pathologies that we deal with. A few things that I think everyone should know, uh, regardless of what stage of training you're at, um, is that the first thing is you can't tell if a mass is benign or malignant based on physical exam. OK, so unfortunately, if you feel something, the first thing you should do is come to an imaging center with people like us. And we, we need to take pictures. Basically, we need to take some radiology pictures of that area. And then we can decide if it's something we need to do anything about something that is firm versus squishy or mobile um, or fixed. None of those adjectives really help us um, in determining whether it's worrisome or not. Some other things to know too, the most common type of breast cancer is invasive ductal carcinoma or IDC. There are other types, but this is the most common one. 
DCIS, uh, the second group here, uh, is basically breast cancer that has not broken out of the ducts. So IDC with the D is, is ductal for all the ducts in your breast. That's where cancer starts. DCIS means that it hasn't broken out of that area yet, but it's still considered a cancer, uh, meaning that we still recommend that you see a surgeon. The surgeon is still going to treat it like a cancer, that sort of thing. Lastly, um, you know, primary breast cancers are the most common things uh, in terms of cancer that we see in the breast, but there's also other types of cancer that we detect too. Uh, so lymphoma, melanoma, lung cancer, all those things can actually metastasize or they can go to the breast. So we sometimes find things that in a person that had no other history of anything, and we're the first person to actually, uh, you know, biopsy and be like, hey, this person actually has a melanoma. Maybe we need to go find out where that primary melanoma is. But without our screening mammogram, uh, we may not, no one may have caught that because the patient wouldn't have come in for a very long time. So that's a pretty nifty thing too about our field. So let me quickly talk a little bit about screening mammogram. Um, so this is basically, uh, you know, like the, the major study um, or the major type of imaging that's been proven to save lives from breast cancer. Um, there are many different guidelines as to when you should get your first mammogram, uh, assuming that you have no symptoms, but we go by the ACR or American College of Radiology guidelines. And that basically means that um, annual mammograms should start at age 40. This reduces mortality from breast cancer by 40% in women that are over 40. Now screening, whether it's breast cancer, colon cancer, whatever, the whole point is to catch things early when you are asymptomatic. We don't want to wait until somebody has a giant mass that they are feeling. When they, I mean, they can still obviously come in, we're still gonna take care of it, but we're gonna try to pick up very, very small cancers um, because that's better for their morbidity, for mortality, for even uh, resource allocation, because you can deal with earlier stage cancers a little bit easier, a lot easier than advanced stages um, for cancer. So that's the whole kind of premise of screening. There are some other uh, types of guidelines from different societies. Um, and all I wanted to show you here is that by delaying mammograms um, until 45 or 50, you're essentially uh, missing a lot of cancers that do present in the 40s. So we say if you're asymptomatic, start at 40 every single year. Um, there's not really an end date either for when you should stop. And that's really because uh, it kind of depends on your health. So I've had patients that are like 88 and they are doing extraordinarily well. They have like almost no other health symptoms. So in that kind of person, if we were to find a breast cancer, um, it's very likely that they would do well with surgery, with radiation, with chemotherapy. So it's, it's none of our basically, like none of us want to kind of prevent them from getting that kind of study when it can really benefit them. So that's why there's not a definitive like end age. Hey, when you hit like 65, like no more for you, nothing like that. Um, obviously it all is a risk benefit sort of analysis. If someone is 75, but they have many, many other issues, they have heart problems, they have lung problems, then this may take a little make a bit of a backseat compared to their other more acute issues. So that's just something to also think about as well. Everything I talked about before was for average risk women. Okay. This is the guidelines for high risk women. We actually recommend yearly mammograms from 30 and above and also uh, breast MRI starting at 25 to 30. Um, so MRIs, in case you guys uh, don't know too much about it, it's more advanced sort of imaging technology. There's no radiation and you can see soft tissue really, really well. Okay. We don't recommend MRIs for everyone for a few reasons. Uh, the first being that they do pick up a lot of what we call false, false positives, meaning that they find things that are actually okay, but can cause patient anxiety, can cause more procedures down the line, things that are really actually okay, but like look weird on imaging. Um, and then of course, MRI is one of the more expensive uh, imaging modalities as well too. Uh, so there's also that to consider. Um, high risk in our scenario basically means that you have a calculated lifetime risk of 20% or higher. Um, and that 20% is based on these different risk models um, that have been created. Another um, risk factor is basically having chest radiation uh, before age 30. So some, some younger people may have had chest radiation for other types of cancer. Um, and radiation to the chest or the breast really um, might increase your risk uh, as well too. So that's what's considered high risk. Most importantly, all women, uh, especially Black women in Ashkenazi Jewish descent, uh, should have their risk evaluated by age 30, their breast cancer risk. So when you go for a mammogram, what happens? So out of 100 women who get a screening mammogram, 90 will be told that their mammogram is normal. Okay. 10 will be asked to return for additional uh, studies, mammograms or ultrasounds. 
Uh, six will be uh, reassured that their mammograms are normal. Two will be asked to return in six months for follow-up, so that middle category. Um, and then two will be recommended to have a biopsy. So this is just kind of an overlay um, of what happens to everyone who gets a screening mammogram. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of imaging modalities that we deal with. In breast imaging, we deal with mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. So mammograms are the oldest um, and most commonly used form of medical imaging. So these are x-rays. Um, so they allow us to see inside the body at the cost of a very small amount of radiation. Each screening mammogram, so remember, these are for asymptomatic people, um, have two views of the breast. There's going to be a CC or what we call cranial caudal. And this is the best way that I think of um, how you can kind of orient yourself. Uh, and then the MLO view, which is the medial lateral oblique. And this is... Um, how it's positioned. And these are the pictures that you will get. This is an example of a mammogram machine in case you haven't seen one before. This is a chair. So the patient's going to sit here. The breast is going to go in between this black surface and then this paddle. Um, and that's what this is kind of representing here. The x-rays are going to go from here all the way down here. And the picture is basically taken. So let me go over the cranial call of view so you have an idea of what mammograms look like. Um, the best way that I visualize this is to kind of look like you're looking down at your feet. Um, this picture on this side is always going to be your right breast, and this one's always going to be your left breast. It's a little confusing. It's just the way we've standardized uh, how we read this imaging. Um, so if you think of it this way, in this picture, if you're looking down at your right side, then your arm would be out here and your sternum would be down here. Let me see. I think I have a picture here. So essentially, this would be if this is your right breast, your lateral or the farthest away from your midline, and we use that term all the time in um, describing anatomy in medicine, lateral means away from the midline of your body, this is going to be where your right arm is, this is going to be where your left arm is, and in medial is going to be towards the center of your body, so that's going to be your sternum or your breastbone. And then of course, you have your nipple here, okay, it's a little bit brighter than the rest of the um, the rest of the breast. And you might see a hint of this kind of white band in the back. That's going to be your pec muscle, your pectoralis major muscle. We get a better view of that on the other picture. One thing I want to start introducing to you guys too, um, is that white tissue is fibroglandular tissue. So that's actual breast tissue. The other component of breast tissue is going to be fat. So it's a mixture of these two things. Um, fat is going to appear black or really like gray on the mammogram. Um, the reason why this is important <clears throat> because this is what determines breast density in case you've heard that term before. And also because cancer, when it appears, it's going to be white. So cancer comes from tissue. So obviously when it's there, it's going to be white. When things are containing fat, like a lipoma, which is a benign fat containing mass, it's going to appear black. And that's going to be very important. I'll show you in a little bit why. Uh, before we go on, I'll show you this, uh, what we call medial lateral oblique view. This view, as you can tell, has a lot more breast tissue than on the other view. All right. And I have a little picture here that kind of shows where we are. So again, this is your right side. This is your left side. Up here at the top of the picture is going to be like your clavicles, your neck, your head. At the bottom is going to be your um, upper abdomen. Okay. This is kind of an easier picture to understand, I feel like, when I was first starting off. Um, again, you have all your breast tissue in between. You can see your nipple a little bit better on both sides. Um, and this big white linear thing, that's going to be your muscle, your pec muscle. And these little dots back here, um, sometimes we see those, and those are your lymph nodes that are in your armpit or axillary region. That's very important because breast cancer sometimes, when they show up, um, they are going to go if, and if they metastasize, one of the first places that they go to is going to be your lymph nodes. Okay. Oftentimes, um, if someone has lymphoma, which is basically a cancer of your lymph nodes, these lymph nodes also are going to be very, very big. So we actually catch this on a mammogram. It's not just the breast that we're looking at. Okay. Um, let me, oh yes. Yeah, so this is what I want to talk to you guys about with breast tissue density. So like I said, tissue is white, fat is black. Density is simply this ratio between these two things. Um, and you can be, you can fall into one of these four categories that the radiologists have come up with. Okay. So uh, you can either range from almost entirely fatty, and this has to do with your breast, by the way, not like your overall body or anything. So this is your breast. And as you can see, there's much more gray here than there is white, right? At the other end, you can tell that there's much more white than there is gray. So at the two extremes, you know, that's not a big part of the population. It makes up about 20%. 
The vast majority, 80%, are going to be in these two categories, okay, scattered and heterogeneously dense. The most important thing um, that I want you guys to know, I want everybody to know, is that density is determined by mammogram, not by clinical exam. So you cannot determine breast tissue density by physical exam. If your primary care doctor or your OB guy tells you you have dense breasts, it has to be based off of a mammogram that a radiologist has read. And in general, density is pretty much related to genetics um, and it's not related to size as one might think. Now there are some things that can increase your density, which means that have you have more tissue throughout your lifetime. So people when they're younger tend to have much more breast tissue uh, compared to fat. And then throughout life, that tissue involutes and becomes fattier. If you're on hormone replacement, um, like in your older years, um, then you can have, <clears throat> you can develop more tissue. If you're breastfeeding, that will also uh, increase your tissue density. Interestingly, um, you can have decreased density if you were to gain weight. So people who gain fat throughout their body, if they were to gain it in their breast, um, especially on both sides, that fat is going to tip this ratio, right? So you'll have more fat than tissue and that can change your density um, as well too. Um, let's see here. This is an example of why tissue density is even important. Why do we even talk about this? So like I said, something that is white um, is going to be tissue or cancer because cancer comes from tissue. So in somebody that is pretty much all gray, mostly fat, um, and if I was to look for something that was white, it would probably stand out fairly well. But in somebody who has like more dense breast tissue and is more white, it's going to be a lot harder for me to find that same finding of that same size and everything. Okay. Just because white on white, is just harder to see. It's just the way our eyes work. So this is why density is very important because number one, um, it affects how we detect things. It's easier for us to detect on this breast than on this. And then also, if you have more breast tissue, um, you generally just have a higher chance of developing breast cancer because you just have more tissue and cancer comes from tissue, like I said. Let's talk a little bit about ultrasound. So I don't know how much you guys know about ultrasound, but this is one of the more like old school imaging modalities. There's no radiation, which is really, really good. <clears throat> and it's really great for soft tissue in general. The problem, of course, is that there are some limitations. <clears throat> There's some limitations uh, of ultrasound. Um, it can be limited by air or what we call calcifications inside the tissue. And it also is very operator dependent, meaning that it depends on how well someone is scanning um, your body, basically. Now, ultrasound is very important to us because it's the first imaging test for women under 30 presenting with a breast lump or breast pain. Mammography does have radiation, so that's part of the reason why. And then also, quite as importantly, mammography is just less useful in young women who have dense tissue, who have a lot of white on their mammogram. Um, just so you know, as well, too, this is not just like some random like decision that people have made. This is uh, from the American College of Radiology. And there's a link down here. Uh, American College of Radiology has created something called the appropriateness criteria. And this is not just for breasts. This is for literally any part of the body for all different types of physicians. And it's basically telling you what is the most appropriate imaging test for your clinical question. If you have a patient with, um, I don't know, chest pain or vaginal bleeding, like what is the first test that you uh, should be ordering, okay? Um, and what happens is the this appropriateness criteria basically gives you a number from one to nine. And nine is gonna be the most appropriate based on all the studies that they've done. So evidence-based, nine is gonna be the most appropriate study. You definitely should order this study if you have this clinical question. And one's going to be like, don't order this. So in this clinical scenario for a female that's younger than 30, initial evaluation of a palpable breast mass, basically a lump, the most uh, appropriate imaging is going to be a breast ultrasound to start with. Okay. And so to give you an idea of what a breast ultrasound looks like and how to kind of position yourself so you can understand what we're looking at, because it's very confusing. Um, we pos position patients in what we call the supine position. Supine means that you're on your back. Okay. The opposite is prone, which is going to be flipped over where you're going to be like on your belly. So in this picture here, if we were to scan this, uh, our patient pushing here, um, the front of the patient is going to be where the ultrasound probe is placed. It's going to be this part of the picture. And then if you keep going further back on Pusheen, this is going to be the back of the patient. Now, we don't go all the way back because it has to do with the strength of the probe. But essentially, uh, what you can see here is the lungs. And during um, biopsies, we try to stay away from this area. This uh, kind of darker line is going to be your pec muscles. So it's actually pretty cool that you can see it um, on ultrasound. And then this is going to be all your breast tissue. And I'll go over this picture again uh, in a little bit. 
Just so you know, our breast MRIs um, are positioned the opposite way. So they are um, what we call prone, as you can see in this picture. This helps extend the breast tissue so that you can actually see all the different things that are enhancing inside the breast tissue. Um, and you might be asking, you know, I've never really heard of a breast MRI, like who needs this? So it's a very specialized test for sure. Um, most importantly, it's good for high risk patients. So patients that have a higher than 20% 20, 20 or higher risk of developing breast cancer throughout their life. Um, it's also useful for patients that have biopsy proven cancer. So let's say this person had breast cancer here. She needs to go to a surgeon. The surgeon wants to know if there's any other areas that are affected before she puts her under anesthesia and, you know, does the whole operation. So MRI can find out other areas of disease. It's also useful for people who've already had the surgery and you think that they may have had recurrence. Okay. The cancer has come back. Um, and lastly, too, it's important for silicone implant evaluation. So these uh, big, like blinding globes are actually implants. And these are silicone implants in case you've never seen them um, on an MRI. Now, this picture is actually flipped upside down. So um, the patient's not laying on their back, as you might see here. Let's see if I can show you. I kind of labeled everything here. Uh, your spine would be down here and your sternum is up here. So it's difficult to kind of orient yourself when you first start off for sure. So let me go over a few cases here, and I try to choose some different things uh, to show you. This is one of our basic kind of cases that we run into. So I'm showing you a mammogram for a 56-year-old female, and she feels a right breast lump that's marked by this BB here. The circle should be over here. So the problem is going to be this uh, clump of white tissue that we see in the back of the breast. This is a mass, and as you can tell, it looks very different from the rest of her tissue. What happens here is that we undergo ultrasound. This is what the mass looks like on ultrasound. By the way, these red things is basically a technology that we use to superimpose on the picture. Anything that is moving is going to have a color to it, a, a red color. Um, and the only things that are moving is going to be blood flow. So blood vessels. The breast is obviously vascular. Um, things that are things that are more vascular are going to be cancers uh, in general, not even just in the breast, um, because that's how tumors grow so fast compared to the rest of the body. They recruit blood vessels, they get more oxygen, and they multiply and they get bigger. So this person underwent a biopsy uh, under ultrasound, and it came back as a cancer, the invasive um, ductal carcinoma, one of the more common breast cancers. When we talk about masses, by the way, we're talking about a space occupying structure. And as the radiologist, we're looking at the shape and the margins to determine how suspicious they are. Masses, even though it's a scary word, are not always bad. Something like a breast cyst, which is basically a little water balloon inside the breast, is technically a mass as well because it's occupying space. Um, a fibroadenoma is a completely benign breast mass that we see most commonly in younger women. That is also a mass as well. Um, so People should not necessarily freak out if they hear that they have a breast mass. In fact, we have been recommending um, that patients don't do self breast exams anymore, but just know how they feel at baseline. Um, their, their baseline lumpy bumpiness is what I call it. Um, and if there's any changes from that, uh, then they come to see us. Okay. Um, another case this is an case of a mass that is not bad. So this is an 81 year old female. She came in uh, with a breast lump and this is her left breast. This is her right breast her MLO view. Um, and this patient was actually on anticoagulation. So that is a blood thinning medication. It's a pill that she takes um, that makes her blood thinner. Why is she on this medication? Well, she had a stroke actually like earlier that year. Um, and a stroke is basically when uh, you form a clot or there's a reason that blood flow cannot get to your brain. Okay. Um, and those patients after they've managed their acute symptoms are going to be put on a medication that kind of prevents clotting from happening. Now you don't want clots in your brain. Okay. Obviously, but you kind of want to clot when you are bleeding elsewhere. Okay. I mean, that's the whole way that you even stop bleeding. So um, that's just something to consider when I talk about this case. So she came in with this breast mass. We do an ultrasound um, and it appears a little bit more black than the other uh masses that we've seen. So the different colors on ultrasound kind of determine, tell you, they tell you whether something is liquid, solid in between. When I see something like this, I can tell that there's going to be some liquid in it. Okay. And so what happens is that, um, I gave some local numbing medication, kind of like at the dentist's office, you put, you know, uh, a needle and you inject some numbing, you put in another needle and then you kind of aspirate or you pull out any fluid that's there. And this is what came out. So this is red, this is bloody. So this is actually not a cancer. 
oops, sorry. This is not a cancer. This is what we call a hematoma. And this is likely from the fact that she's been on blood thinning medication. Now, sometimes it can just happen where someone just spontaneously bleeds. We don't have a reason. Um, more often than not, there's some sort of what we call micro trauma. So maybe she bumped into something and she just didn't think about it. And ordinarily it wouldn't cause an issue at all, but because she's on this blood thinning medication, um, she developed a hematoma, which is basically a collection of blood um, that's kind of self-contained. Um, and at this point, you know, as long as it's not continuing to bleed, this is a pretty much benign situation, meaning it's not a cancer. It's certainly, you know, a, a reason for what she's feeling, but it's not a cancer. So that's an example of a benign mass. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this next case. This is a 29 year old female who comes in with a left breast lump. Uh, the first imaging study that she should get is gonna be an ultrasound because remember she's under 30. And this is her targeted ultrasound right over the lump. And I ask you, what is this thing? So that's exactly what she's feeling. She's pointing exactly to this area. So I labeled it out for you. This is actually her rib. And this happens a lot in thin women, um, women that do not have much breast tissue. They kind of feel around and their lumps are actually the bones that are lying underneath. The skin is going to be up here in an ultrasound. This area is going to be your breast tissue. This is where we're looking for masses, cysts, anything like that. Um, it's a combination of gray and white because it's a mixture of fat and tissue. Like I said before, this is your pec muscle, your chest wall muscle that allows you to open and close doors. Um, these are your ribs and underneath that or behind that is going to be your lungs. And actually what's really cool is that during a procedure, I can see some of the breathing and I can see these lungs kind of go up and down like this. Um, and that's the area that we avoid, obviously, when we are using needles. So let me quickly talk a little bit about something else in the breast that you may have heard of that's not common elsewhere. Um, these are calcifications. So calcifications are little bright white spots that we see on mammogram. They don't cause pain. Um, they don't cause lumps or anything. And actually you get them in all parts of your body as well. But the unique thing in the breast is that they can actually be associated with, um, with the cancer. Um, they're not necessarily good or bad. It's our job as a radiologist to determine whether it's something that we need to worry about. We look at the shape and we look at the distribution on mammogram. So let me give you some examples, just two examples here. This is a 65 year old female who presents for a screening mammogram. And this is, uh, you know, right breast, right breast, left breast, left breast. Um, and you can see that there's all these crazy bright white lines, like just zigzagging back and forth. So these are vascular calcifications, meaning they're in the blood vessels, normal blood vessels. Um, some terms that we use to describe this is curvilinear or tram track. Basically that means <clears throat> they're aligning the uh, vessel wall. So you might see like two lines like this. Okay. This is a completely benign finding. We do not worry about it in this 65 year old. This is totally a normal look for a person on the, of this age group. Now, the interesting thing is that if she was younger, let's say she was 40 or so, um, this would be unusual to have so many calcifications. Um, people that are diabetic though, or are in renal failure at the age of 40 would still have this. So it's kind of interesting because let's say this patient just, you know, she's had clinical symptoms, but she just never wanted to go to the doctor, except she decided to get a mammogram when she hit you know, a year later than she was supposed to, but 41, um, we may be the first people to raise uh, the concern that she has another systemic issue going on. Um, and then she would get referred to, you know, her endocrinologist and that sort of thing and get worked up for other issues. Now, this is in contrast to this uh, group of calcifications. Um, hopefully you can tell that these are completely different. Uh, these don't look like that crazy white lines. These are very suspicious calcifications. All you need to know is that they're kind of in the shape of what we call ducts um, in those in the ductal formation that of in your breast. So this is a very high chance of being malignant. So we ended up biopsying it and it came back as DCIS, which is based, which is a cancer. So that's what a uh, bad calcification looks like. And the most important thing that I want to share with you about all this is that calcium, like I said, you can't feel. Um, and it sometimes, it oftentimes does not create um, any abnormality in ultrasound. So we do have patients who hate mammograms, which I understand, um, both from compression, from concern for radiation, from just like bad science, people saying that mammograms cause cancer, which it doesn't. Um, but essentially, so, you know, if we were to just do ultrasounds for everyone, we would miss things like this. This is something that you only see on a mammogram. Um, so that's what the utility of a mammogram is. One of the many examples. Okay. 
Um, let's talk a little about breast implants, which is a kind of unique area within my field. So I've had patients ask, you know, I've implants, should I still get mammograms? Obviously the concern is that they're going to get ruptured. Okay. They're going to just basically pop. So our techs actually have special methods to help display, displace the implants during mammography so that there's an almost 0% chance of rupture. I think there are cases in the literature where an implant has broken after a mammogram, but I do believe those implants have been very old slash may already have been leaking to begin with. I personally have not seen it happen. And I don't think any of my colleagues have as well too. Most importantly, um, people with implants can still get breast cancer. So it's just as important for them to get it as if they didn't have implants. Okay. One thing that's interesting is that they may, it may make it harder for us to do biopsies. And this is an example of an implant in case you have never seen one. They come in different sizes. This is definitely on the larger side. It's uh, over 700 uh, cc's. Um, we see some cool imaging too that's related to breast implants. Um, this is an example of ruptured uh, saline implants. All you need to know here is that if a saline implant, because there's a, these two different types of implants, if it's saline, you can generally tell if it's ruptured on physical exam, okay? Um, you don't need to get any other imaging. One side would literally just be flatter compared to the other. Um, and the saline, you know, no harm, no foul. It actually gets resorbed by the body. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. Silicone can often rupture and it doesn't change the shape that much because it's a more gooey, viscous sort of material. So there are probably people walking around out there with silicone ruptures that don't even know it because nothing's changed from their perspective. Um, we do see it, the ruptures best on MRI, sometimes on MAMO, sometimes on ultrasound. Um, and when it gets spilled in the breast, it does stay there and it appears very, very bright. It also can be uh, resorbed by the uh, axillary lymph nodes. So sometimes we'll see silicone uh, in the lymph nodes in your armpit area as well too. So that's always kind of cool. Let me talk a little bit about the procedures that we do in our remaining time. Um, so the four major procedures that we do are biopsies, localizations, abscess drainages, and cyst aspirations. So just so you know, um, we use local lidocaine for all procedures. It means that patients, you know, don't have to, they can drive themselves in the morning because they don't undergo general anesthesia. They can eat whatever they want. Um, and it's a procedure, not a surgery. So we do it in our own clinics by ourselves. All right. Uh, and this is just an example of the tray that we usually have. Uh, let's see, what can I, what's the most interesting thing here is this is going to be your biopsy device here. Uh, it's a long needle that it just takes a very, very small piece of uh, tissue that we then send to the pathologist. So let me give you an example of an abscess drainage. This is pretty cool. So this is a 26 year old, uh, who had a left nipple ring. She came in with, um, a red lump that under her nipple and and she had gone to her primary care doctor, gave her some antibiotics, but it just wasn't responding. So the concern in these patients is that there's an infected pocket of fluid underneath. Um, and these things, you know, after a certain size cannot get resorbed on their own. The body needs help. Um, they need us to decompress this area. Otherwise it would just not heal. So this, you know, in case you don't know how big this is, cause it's kind of disorienting here. Uh, it's actually about four centimeters. So it's not as big as it seems, but four centimeters is quite big for an abnormal finding within the breast. And we are right underneath the nipple, by the way. Um, remember that I said all that like color red stuff means that's vascular. Well, there's a lot of vascularity around this thing because it's very infected. It's inflamed. It's hot. It's no good. Um, there's a bunch of bacteria in here. It's, it's an infection. So what we do um, is we do an aspiration of this area. It's very similar to a cyst aspiration that we do, by the way. So this is an example of uh, kind of our intra procedural pictures that we do. This is the needle. This is the abscess. And this is all the stuff that came out. Um, so all this stuff in here is purulent or basically pus like fluid. Uh, and there's a little bit of blood that's also, uh, in this sample as well. So this stuff is going to get sent to the pathologist. They're going to see what kind of bacteria is in here. And once they do that, uh, I mean, they're looking for other things as well too, but the whole, the whole point is to really narrow down the type of bacteria that's here. So you can know exactly what sort of antibiotics to put this patient on. You generally start people on very general antibiotics and you want to narrow it down as much as you can. So you're targeting only a specific type to make it most useful uh, as a sort of treatment. Okay. Um, let me talk to you about uh, localizations as well. So 
in case you don't know, a mastectomy is when a surgeon removes an entire breast for cancer. A lumpectomy is when the surgeon removes only the cancer itself, so a smaller portion. But they need guidance on where exactly that spot is, because as you can imagine, the breast is kind of like a sphere, and it's very hard to find specific areas uh, to take out. So what happens is that a patient will come to us the morning of a surgery. So let's say she's been biopsied by someone, and we know that she's got cancer in this one particular area here. Um, that radiologist puts a little small clip, this kind of, uh, bright white rectangle. Um, it's a biopsy clip that goes in this area and marks that area. So for me, when I come and see this patient, I know exactly where her cancer is. So my job is to basically use lidocaine and mammography, and I place a needle and a wire down to this area. So this wire that you see here is this wire here. Um, and my goal basically is to put a wire down exactly to where that cancer is, um, and then the patient will go to the operating room that same day and the surgeon will take out that cancer using that wire. Um, so it's called a wire localized, you know, lumpectomy or excision because it's very focused. I'm taking, I'm seeing the cancer in imaging and I'm telling the surgeon exactly where it's going to be. Okay. Um, and this happens all in the same day to double check that everything correct was taken out because the worst case scenario is that, you know, we close up the patient um, and we send them home and then we find out that actually no cancer was removed. We had missed it. That's like the worst case scenario. So to double check, to make sure that doesn't happen, the surgical specimen is sent to us uh, to evaluate as the patient is still in the operating room. And we make sure that the cancer that's marked by the biopsy clip is in the specimen. And this helps ensure that the surgeon got the right tissue before closing the patient up. And in case you want to look at how uh, it is in real life. This is an example of a different type of wire, but it's exactly the same premise. This is uh, the actual tissue itself. Your breast tissue is not rainbow colored, unfortunately. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Um, these are different inks uh, that the surgeon is placing to kind of uh, mark uh, how this tissue was oriented in real time. So for instance, they may say, hey, um, when they take out from the breast, and they're looking at the patient, they say, hey, this area that's in the blue, that's gonna be along the inferior or bottom part of the breast. Um, and the red one is gonna be at the top part of the breast. So that way, if I'm looking at this x-ray and this clip and this cancer is actually all the way at the edge, I can tell the surgeon, hey, I actually think it's uh, closer to the blue edge. And then they will know, hey, that means the bottom part, I need to take out more tissue from this specific area. This is an x-ray of this particular uh, surgery specimen. Um, and like we can see here, this is the wire itself. That's this wire. This is the cancer. And then this is that little uh, rectangular marker that's right next to it. So this is a pretty cool procedure that we do. Like I said, I probably do them, you know, like once a day, if not more, depending on the site as well, too. Um, so a lot of our clinics are associated very closely with hot with the main hospitals, which is where people do their surgeries. And I think that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about radiology in general, uh, about this particular specialty, about academic medicine. Um, if you have any questions, you can always message me as well, too. Um, I'm always happy to share kind of my experiences, uh, any sort of advice that I can kind of provide you guys as well, too. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having me. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Hello, Dr. Chan. We're going to go ahead and send you some of the questions. Okay. Okay. First question. Is it safe for the body to absorb saline silicone? Saline's totally fine. Um, I mean, we inject, we, you know, saline's part of the body, so that's totally normal. Silicone, um, it's not like it's not unsafe. Um, you can get inflammatory processes around silicone. So I don't know if you know this, but um, before implants were developed, um, people would actually inject silicone into the breast, like free silicone. And you still can technically get it done at like in certain countries It's illegal in the US, but in certain countries you can, uh, you literally go to like some back alley and a non-medical professional will just like inject silicone in different parts of your breast. So it's not necessarily, um, bad for the body. The problem is, is that it obscures the rest of the tissue. So when that person eventually comes with their screening mammogram, it's extremely hard for us to see that tissue in between these big globs of silicone. Um, so silicone itself is not bad, but it does cause a reaction around it that can um, make it harder for us to detect cancers in the future. Breast implants an issue uh, to see what you want in radiology. What 
let me see, are breast implants an issue to see what you want in radiology? Oh, I see. Um, they can, not necessarily, uh, because like I said, our technologists can push implants away uh, and kind of just expose the real tissue, the tissue that could have cancer. Um, so there are ways of uh, making, of pushing away the implant so that we can see what we need to. It is a little bit more difficult uh, when we have to do procedures like biopsies, because we do not want the needle you know, piercing the implant. Now, if somebody has a lot of normal breast tissue and they also happen to have an implant, then it's not too difficult either. So it's really a ratio between your, your normal tissue or your native tissue and your implant. That's really what matters. If you don't have much tissue and, and you're mostly implant in your breast, then yes, the biopsies can be tougher, but we always try our best um, to get what we need without going anywhere near the implant. Why did I choose to specialize in breast? So uh, I personally really like so I love radiology, um, obviously. I also really like the clinical aspects of radiology. I did not want to, you know, look at pictures uh, away from people uh, for the rest of my life because I think the, the coolest thing about radiology is finding things that just aren't as apparent on a physical exam. And that's, I mean, that's really the utility. If you could see all the things that we did without using imaging, then there'd be no use for radiology, right? So breast imaging is awesome because we get to see patients um, and do procedures. So I wanted a job that I did a mix of things, including screening, diagnostic, and procedures. I get through my day much, much happier, to be honest. I feel like the day goes by a lot faster. Um, I have fun doing procedures. Maybe it's because I played video games when I was younger. I don't really know. Um, but hand-eye coordination and like those kind of procedural challenges are really fun. Not every specialty within radiology has that. Um, and then most importantly, I think breast radiology, you know, only, only we can read um, our studies. Uh, it's a very, you know, unique field that's split between us and like the breast surgeons, the breast pathologists, but we're all very specialized in this one area. And I, I felt like I was, I had a lot of utility, uh, in this kind of specialized field. I did consider IR. That was my other, um, main specialty I considered when I was going through radiology, which is also very procedural based, very clinical based as well too. So I was going to go in this sort of direction, I think, um, regardless. And then of course, lastly, the fact that you're helping 50 percent of the population, if not more, when you see male patients is very, very cool too. Um, that was a really big part of it for me. I wanted to help as many people as I could uh, doing something that I enjoyed. So that's why I like it. Can I tell the difference between a milk duct or a lump with just an ultrasound? Of course you can. Um, so a milk duct uh, is gonna be, it's gonna look like a line like this on an ultrasound. We often don't see them actually, unless there's something uh, that's blocking the duct itself. When I'm looking at a regular breast ultrasound, everyone has ducts, but I don't necessarily see them unless there is something that's growing inside of that duct itself. Okay. Um, a lump is going to be, you know, either it's going to be a mass of some kind. It's either going to be fluid based, like a cyst, or it's going to be solid, which is going to look very different uh, from a duct. So, yes, I can tell that on an ultrasound. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan, for an awesome presentation. We enjoyed all the photos you incorporated in the presentation and thank you so much for presenting. Of course, thank you for having me, everyone. Like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to message me. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Everyone, make sure you check out her socials. Her Instagram is dr.chanamo. Again, thank you all so much for attending our session today. I've just posted the Google form in the live chat and it will also be in the description of the video. So please make sure you fill it out within the next 30 minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan. We loved your presentation and everyone saying that um, academia is your calling. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm, I'm super happy to, uh, to have made it so far in this field and I hope to help other people get